Alors, euh, chers amis, bienvenue à, à ce panel sur les frontières et la migration sur la présidence de celui dont on ne dira pas le nom. Euh, encore une fois, euh, estimados amigos, bienvenue à ce panel sur les frontières et les migrations et l'impact de l'administration euh, de elle que nous devons ser nombrados. J'aime cette façon de dire les choses. Um, Uh, we have heard before the lunch, the first uh, panelist, uh, Professor Coronado, uh, was talking about the dreamers um, and what they are experiencing in those borderlands and how the president's discourse has affected the policies and the behavior of the Border Patrol and Immigration Agency. Donc maintenant, c'est le panel 3, Frontières Immigration, Le Retour. Et nous avons ici trois panelistes qui marquent et définissent en grande partie uh, les études frontalières, tant sur le plan théorique, et c'est la particularité des études frontalières, des borders studies, comme on le dit, euh, que pratique. Vous l'avez vu avec Irazema Coronado, parce qu'on ne peut pas omettre cette composante pratique, euh, un peu les deux pieds dans la boîte, hein, quand on est euh, au pied du mur, en contact avec les gens, des vrais gens, donc en dehors de, 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 de la composante strictement théorique, euh, en contact avec l'environnement et, et ce que subissent donc ces gens de cette frontière qui est euh, toujours plus dure. So, es un honor para mí presentarles a nuestros tres panelistas. First, Guadalupe Correra Cabrera, so it's a lot of R for me, <laughs> is professor at Charles School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. And if you study borders in the US, you will crum, come across her name very often. Elle est incontournable sur le sujet. Et s'il fallait une preuve, sachez qu'elle est présidente de l'Association for Borderland Studies. Um, elle mène une recherche importante, uh, financée, sur le trafic de personnes en Amérique centrale, Mexique et États-Unis. Uh, C'est ce dont elle va nous parler aujourd'hui. Uh, Eva Moya est interim chair and professor at the Department of Social Work, College of Health Science at the beautiful University of Texas at El Paso. Uh, le campus est inspiré d'une uh, architecture uh, du Bhoutan. C'est très zen et on a le sentiment qu'il n'y a aucune querelle académique qui peut se dérouler là, mais on me dit que ce n'est pas tout à fait le cas. <rire> Elle travaille depuis longtemps sur les questions de santé publique, et vous l'aurez compris, sur les questions de santé publique dans les zones euh, frontalières, parce que l'accès aux soins de santé peut être complexe. Pour vous donner un exemple, vous avez peut-être entendu parler de cette enfant de 10 ans, Maria Rosa, qui a été interceptée lors de son transfert entre deux hôpitaux en urgence. Elle a été interceptée à un checkpoint. Les border patrol l'ont suivie jusqu'à la salle d'opération l'ont attendu à la sortie pour l'arrêter à la 10 ans, pour l'arrêter et l'interner euh, dans un centre d'internement pour enfants loin de ses parents. So women in the borderlands are stuck in a twilight zone sometimes, and there are, uh, their realities are, can be very peculiar to say the least, so Eva Moya will be addressing uh, that, uh, that matter. Third, and not the least, and you have to understand that we had to address gender parity. We had to have at least one man on the panel. <laughs> But Scott Nicol is way more than the man of the panel. Uh, Scott is an amazing academic, researcher, artist, activist, and all of this at the same time. Uh, il est professeur en art visuel au Collège Styles, Texas. Vous pouvez voir son portfolio artistique uh, qui est magnifique. Sur son site, c'est scottnicolart.com. Uh, il est également co-président du Sierra Club Frontalier, très investi dans la question environnementale frontalière. Uh, C'est d'ailleurs aussi ce qu'on retrouve dans ses œuvres. Uh, C'est un activiste. Uh, the focus of much of his work is the uh, environmental and human impacts of federal enforcement along the US-Mexico border, et surtout par rapport au mur frontalier uh, qui scarifie la frontière. You have to understand for that for each of those three panelists, I am cutting it very short. But, debo decir mi admiración por estos tres investigadores extraordinarios. Es un privilegio tener usted, ustedes, con nosotros. So we will start with uh, Guadalupe, and she's going to tell us about trafficking of migrants and organized crime in Central America, Mexico, and the U.S. Thank you. Uh, what do you mean? Thank you, and I appreciate the invitation to be here, and I appreciate, uh, I, I thank you all, all, I thank all of you to, uh, for, for being here. Um, this, uh, this presentation and, and this day, the conversations that we had today, made me think about uh, the fact that there are many problems, 
in North America. There are many problems in Mexico, in, in, in Central America, all connected, transnational, businesses, formal, informal, legal, and illegal. And we have not yet talked about you know, several issues, and especially during this time. One year of President Trump's, uh, I mean, one year uh, of President Trump. We are really, we are really focusing more on what he says, what he doesn't say. The media is focusing completely on his discourse or his tweets. And we are just not focusing on very crucial matters. And I, and I studied, um, I, I have been studying organized crime, migrant smuggling, human trafficking, and all that has to do with, with the border and in a, in, a, in a border that has been very complicated, the poorest uh, segment of the, of the border region, of the US-Mexico border, and so many problems that we have lived with regards to healthcare, the envi environmental issues, um, organized crime, drug trafficking, and, and I think that now with this new discourse, with these new ways of advertising, um, and so, or, 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 or trying to, to depict certain ideas, we're really losing track of very important, of very important phenomena. And I am going to talk to you about uh, a human problem of great dimensions, that it's connected with a phenomenon that has been also um, obscured or misinterpreted by uh, an electoral campaign that started with this. For the first time, probably in the history of Mexico-US relations, Mexicans um, and Central Americans were important uh, for, for a political campaign, mainly Mexicans, mainly Mexico. This was the first time that in, 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 in the United States electoral campaign, you know, Mexico occupied a central, a central space. And, and, and the way it has been depicted, uh, like does not un, uh, does not allow us to to, to see things the way they, we need to see at these things. There's 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 this like idea that has been uh, reproduced by the media and of course advanced by the president of Mexicans being you know uh, a country where bad hombres exist that we need to combat the bad hombres and Central America the place of the of the a concept that I don't understand very well, MS-13, and I don't understand what, what really the president is, is the president of the United States is talking about. And we're talking about, he's utilizing all these, you know, images and, and, and conceptions in a, in, a, in, a, in a perverted way, so we, we, we really don't understand, and we obscure uh, what's really happening, and that's affecting human, and, and that is affecting human lives. Uh, I, I had the opportunity to go along the migration routes uh, for one year and a half, interviewing migrants, interviewing uh, migrant shelter workers, activists, law enforcement agents uh, in Mexico, Central America, and on the United States-Mexico border to try to understand the relationship between, uh, between human trafficking, migrant smuggling, and organized crime. And there is this big connection uh, that has to do mainly with the policies advanced in the United States. The border enforcement has put uh, people in danger, but not only migrants um, and human beings in danger because of the, of the impossibility and because of the vulnerability and the, because of the high cost and the criminality that takes advantage of these people, but also has strengthened the connection between criminal groups and smuggling networks, transnational smuggling networks, and human trafficking networks. This is this is important, and also there has been uh, there has been an intention of of really obscuring the human problem and connecting it to criminal activity, which is not necessarily what happens. And and I had the the this 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 opportunity to to interview uh, to, to interview. Um, dozens of migrants along the routes, migrants that were deported in Central America, and try to see what are the main problems that, that, that are connected with these three phenomena, human trafficking, migrant smuggling, and organized crime. Uh, the reasons, the root causes of, of the movement of people are the pull and push factors that we have um, that we have, I mean, that we have heard of and we have analyzed, and the media has put together. I mean, the media has advanced like like uh, what, some of the reasons why women, children, and men from from Central America 
in its majority now because Mexico has stopped being uh, a ascending, ascending nation of migrants. Now net migration flows have uh, not only gotten to zero, but, but decreased and, and became a little bit negative according to some of the statistics that are available by the Pew, uh, the Pew Research Center and the Migration Policy Institute. So what what it's what it's um what it has been an issue uh, are the the central i mean the central american population that that comes to the united states and one of the causes is like the extension of organized crime in the form of what we know as uh, transnational criminal gangs or maras what what it's called here the ms13 with with no understanding of how this model works and how this model uh, affects the societies in central america and it is what drives central Americans to go. This is not a national security problem for the United States. It's a national security in Central America. It is, and and also there are there are actors that that are involved in human trafficking because of the forced labor for criminal activities inside Central America. But there is a misunderstanding of the connection that exists between the United States um, and 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 uh, mo uh, migrant smuggling along Mexico, uh, human trafficking along Mexico, and in the United States. What it's what what uh, what what this project um, what this project analyzes is that the poverty, the inequality. Uh, this expansion of this model because of corruption, of because of involvement of, of several politicians and, and, the, and the protection that they give to criminal gangs, law enforcement, local law enforcement agents, and the prison system itself generates a space for the expansion of this model. That this model is basically, uh, I mean, fed with, with the, the, the extortion capacity of these gangs, the, the extraction of rents within Central America. It's not, it's not a US problem where, where, where these gangs are gonna kill uh, U.S. citizens, but it's mainly a, a, a model of extortion, extracting rents in Central America, and of course, uh, also the involvement of young um, young males or or, 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 or women to these to these to these new uh, activities or these activities of extraction of rents, and 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 therefore the first labor to uh, I mean to to contribute to these spaces of of criminality in Central America, and because of that. Several children, women, men are forced to, to, to flee to the United States, notwithstanding the fact that along the migration routes, uh, they face uh, organized crime, criminal organizations of, all, of, of, of different types, not only what in the United States is called, they're called drug cartels, but also uh, corrupt law enforcement agents that are connected to to local criminal groups and um, organized crime uh, that have diversified in the in the past few years, they are not only connected to drugs. So the discourse has has obscured our understanding of how these networks really work. If all this is connected to drugs, or if if each um, if each criminal group has its space and its own business. What I, what, what, but me and my team were able to, um, I mean, to understand with this, with this, uh, with this project of one year and a half, talking to migrants, was that you know, all these groups of migrant smugglers and human traffickers and criminal uh, organizations all work in their own business, but they find themselves, they, they collaborate, but that are not the same. We're not talking about migrants that are willing to be smuggled into the United States that, that are part of the, of the criminal uh, groups or are part of the criminal gangs and they, and they, then, and they are enemies of, of this country. What has to be, I mean, what one of, one of um, um, a very important um, reason, uh, as I say, it's poverty and, and this, uh, the, there is a, there is a, a problem because of the vulnerability of the of the migrants that are willing to go to the United States under very vulnerable conditions, they end up being also forced to work in in activities that they were not thinking in the same in the in the first place, and this is why I'm I'm talking about human trafficking. Human trafficking is uh, a subject of big concern for the government of the United States, and and this is where the Republicans. Uh, I mean, have a consensus, and they, they, this is this is an area of, of study. There's there there are, there are uh, substantial resources for uh, for combating the crime, but 
but not a lot of understanding of, of this connection between what is migrant smuggling and human trafficking. Some people don't understand that there is a difference between migrant smuggling and human trafficking, and many of you may, might not know. Migrant smuggling has to do with, with, with the fact that a person, uh, cons I mean, con consensually, want to go, want to be transported from one place to another one illegally with the help of another person, so a smuggler is a coyote who, that facilitates that, that journey, while human trafficking, we have a victim and a victimary. In the, in the case of migrant smuggling, we have two people that are willing to, one that's willing to, to pay to be transported, and the other one that's facilitating this, this transportation and this, this, uh, this, 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 uh, this um, uh, the, the, the journey to, from, from one place to another one illegally. And with regards to human trafficking, we're talking about uh, forced fraud of, of, or coercion when somebody is, is forced to, to work and vulnerability, are, I mean, vulnerability is a condition that, that facilitates this crime. So we have a victim and a victim. Many people don't, don't know a lot the, the difference between one and the other one. In the case of the migration routes, we have, and we have observed that there is this uh, great area where because of the, of the vulnerability of migrants and because of, of US policy and because of Mexico's immigration policy, that all is connected to, to, to this discourse of, of, of criminality as well. The closing of borders has, has put um, human beings under, under extreme, extreme vulnerability and, and are subject to be uh, recruited by, by, criminal, by criminal gangs and by other groups. Uh, women and children are also subject to, to be forced into into prostitution, into uh, sex work. I mean, not not sex work, but into prostitution. They're forced to 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 uh, I mean to develop these activities. There are a lot of minors that are also involved in 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 these in these activities, not not consensually, but um, but but uh, thinking that it's consensually, but because of the, their situation of vulnerability, they along the routes. Are, are willing to, to, to do certain activities without knowing what is the end or what will be the end. So we, uh, I mean, this, is, this, was, um, this was a project trying to understand the relationship between organized crime and human trafficking, which were the groups, where you found the groups, in which activities, where migrants have been forced to work, for which groups. Uh, we took this, this idea from, from what happened in the years 2009-2012, uh, where Mexico uh, was, was living the highest points of violence because of the uh, of a war on drugs that was declared by, uh, by the Mexican president and the involvement of the state uh, fighting the uh, criminal organizations and, and uh, as a response to the militarization of organized crime, the, the appearance of a group called Losetas and, and, and other groups that, 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 were, that had access to military tactics and to, and to, and to arms of high, high caliber, and they were started forcing migrants to work for them. We saw that in the year 2010, we, in, the, in the month of August, 72 migrants were found in a ranch very near from the place that I used to work in Brownsville, Texas, and they were, uh, they, they were all killed um, uh, yes, thank you. They were all killed um, and, uh, because they, they were not, they, they didn't want to work with this group. And also there were 200 bodies found in the same place uh, some months uh, afterwards. And, and there were many reports of, of, of migrants being, being recruited by, by, this criminal, by, this, by, by these criminal groups. So we found and we tracked uh, the different activities and how uh, migrants were were forced to forced to work for this for these criminal groups in different activities. This is what we what we visited. Um, this is the difference between migrant smuggling and human trafficking. Uh, there was I mean there's no time to be more specific of what activities. But but with regards to sex trafficking, we see more of this. Forced labor, I mean, forced, uh, I mean, sex trafficking uh, or, or the involvement of women, children, of course, and men. Uh, this, the, the concentration of the activities uh, gets, uh, it's, it's on the southern border. We also try to, to figure out how labor trafficking of migrants, we didn't, we, it, 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 is, it was not easy to, 
to, to see how criminal uh, groups uh, involve people in, in other activities more than forced labor for criminal activities. And we see that these so-called war on drugs really give the possibility of these groups to have, I mean, to to have people in vulnerable position and, uh, and because of the necessity of these uh, criminal groups to fight uh, a, a war against the, the, the state or today because of the availability of, of, of undocumented migrants that are deported to the border, how criminal groups are able to, to recruit uh, forcefully or voluntarily people that have no other choice than to, to try to cross again to the United States. So there is a, I mean, there are, there are, there are so many things in, in, in these maps and, and at different moments in the past six years, uh, but, but, the, but, the, but there, is a, there is a link between criminal groups and human traffickers and migrant smugglers, but the link is not that the criminal organizations are the traffickers or the smugglers. We saw that there is a, there is a, there is a, that there are groups of transnational migrant smugglers that operate separately from uh, from criminal organizations, which is something that we need to to I mean we, we we need to understand really clearly because the criminal groups are not the ones that are moving people from from Central America to the United States. That's very, very important because the, the discourse has been different and this is where the migrants are connected to, to, to criminality just because they want to move to, to the United States. There is, um, I mean, the human, human traffickers that involve people in their activities are some of them and the involvement of women in, in prostitution networks, mostly in the southern part of Mexico, which is where, you, when, where, where these uh, networks are concentrated, um, they, they, I mean, they take advantage of the vulnerability of migrants, but definitely they are not the criminal groups that operate in the northern part of Mexico or charge an extortion fee to these uh, coyotes or migrant smugglers and the migrants themselves. So we have an extortion model uh, from, from the gangs that operate in Central America, and we need to, uh, we need to, 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 to divide that. And we also, have, uh, uh, we also have criminal groups that only operate in Mexico. The gangs do not operate in the migrant smuggling business. They operate in Central America extracting, extracting rents with their own logics, but they don't cross and they don't operate the migrant smuggling routes in, 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 in Mexico. Mexican criminal groups are the owners of Mexico criminal routes. And um, at the border, they charge an extortion fee to the smugglers, but they are not the smugglers per se. They just like, and we, and we talked about that. There is a distinction, and, and this distinction is very important in, with, with regards to the, to the policies. Uh, and, uh, and another interesting, fi uh, 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 another interesting uh, finding in this, in, this, in this project was that, yes, thank you. Another very interesting finding is, is, is is, is, is the corruption that, that is really what is allowing corruption on both sides of the border, probably that's facilitating the passage of people from one place to the other one. But there is a lot of understanding of where these human trafficking networks, first labor for different activities and sex trafficking takes place, but there is no action by the different the governments of the different countries. So these are transnational businesses that are not that are not addressed in the correct way. And there is a lot of misunderstanding about these connections and about the nature of criminality. So thank you. And if you have some other doubts, we we are um, uh, producing certain papers that that explain much better what what I presented here. Thank you. Thank you. C'est assurément extrêmement difficile de résumer un an et demi de recherche terrain, littéralement le long des routes migratoires d'Amérique centrale jusqu'aux états unis en 15 minutes. Donc, merci beaucoup. Merci. <laughs> Eva, Eva Maya will be talking about women in the borderlands, migration, health and social realities. And this is not going to get any more happier than it's been so far. Okay, I do hope. <laughs> Uh, it is truly an honor to be here, and I want to first of all start by crediting a, a, a young, very promising, and talented professional. Her name is Andrene Bissonnet. 
I met you in El Paso, Texas, and I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. We had a conversation, you know, as professors, we're in the academic world, right, and we get emails all the time. And some of the emails, you sort of like begin to put a face to why would someone from Canada would like to meet with a professor in El Paso, Texas, yes, in a beautiful Bhutanese campus, and would like to discuss issues around women's health. And the moment that I saw the subject line say women's health, disparities in the border region, a conversation, I said, I'm gonna stop what I'm doing, and I wanna have this conversation, only to find out that I'm here as a result of a conversation with you, so thank you. Because, you know, otherwise, I would still be in El Paso doing the stuff that I love to do, but today I'm here and this is what matters. So, and thank you so much, Elizabeth, for, for leading. So how about a round of applause for the future professionals? <laughs> and hopefully a policy decision maker. So I'm gonna do two things that I don't have in slides. And the first thing is, is I've been thinking since yesterday and sort of like listening to the discourse of one year after the choice of a president that I did not choose, others did. And so, however, I do take responsibility for the state of affairs that we have the country in, and so therefore, we, need, we have our work cut out, as I say. There are two things that I don't have in slides that I wanna say. First is, we're living at a time of great stigmas. And stigmas that carry, unfortunately, negative connotations. And stigmas, as you know, are labels that we place on people, on positions, on special groups, on populations. And so when we start talking about women, about immigrants and migrants, these words are loaded with different interpretations. So living at the time of stigmas, living under the administration of uh, Mr. Donald Trump, uh, surrounded by fear, which is grounded in indifference and ignorance, which then generates a series of hate, which then again provides for more differences and inability to really understand each other and respect, that's not a very healthy condition. And that's a condition that needs to be addressed by all. And that's not that you can cure with an even having the best health insurance product in the market. So that's sort of like the big macro picture. Now the good news is that Given those situations and everything else that we've bombarded, there are incredible things we can do. So I envision that ideally this period of the administration is helping us want to unite and organize and create better and more efficient resistance. So that is what is going to trump Trump. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna say it again, that accompanied by strategy, hope, love, and determination is gonna trump whatever we have been dealing with, and so that's what we need to really keep in mind, but strategy is extremely important. So now let, let me go to my topic, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna get help from Elizabeth in terms of time, otherwise I'll be here. Um, UTEP is an incredible facility, indeed it is Bhutanese style, the only Bhutanese architecture outside of Bhutan. So if you wanna come closer to Bhutan, come to El Paso, and, and that's our campus. And um, when you look at my campus, that's already Juarez, Mexico, my office is behind one of these buildings, and every day I look to Mexico, and I look to the state of New Mexico, and I look to the state of Texas. So I'm truly in the epicenter of the U.S.-Mexico border, mile 1,000, surrounded by two countries and three states. Um, our university is primarily grounded in minority communities. However, it's very interesting, because how we define minority is uh, how the federal government defines minority, we call majority, because in my community, 80% of our students are primarily Hispanic, Latino, of Mexican origin, so it's fascinating how we also don't wanna get trapped in, in language. Mm -hmm. I come to you with um, just a little bit of experience. You know, I'm a borderlander, born in El Paso, really by accident. Um, my mother used to work undocumentedly between the two countries, and she had all maternity services arranged for in Mexico, and it happened that I was, it was time. And so therefore I was born in El Paso, and I was moved immediately into Mexico, so I really grew up understanding and learning that as a borderlander I was Mexicana, but I was also a U.S. citizen by birth. And so the beauty is that for the last 30 years, I've been grounded in basically social work and public health. I already mentioned that 80% of our students are primarily Hispanic, and about 20% of my students in social work are borderlanders. They're crossing that international border uh, almost on a daily basis. Um, my experience is grounded in, in being a native of the region, and that's what shapes my lens at the end of the day. And I've been really focusing on, on in being in the trenches with communities that are highly resilient, 
very vulnerable, but at the same time highly marginalized. Um, so we're interdependent, United States and Mexico. At the end of the day, I think I've been, I've, I've been reading this. We're probably one of the most unequal borderlands in the world in terms of the asymmetry of economics and classes and status. Uh, we have an incredible apparatus in terms of security. You wanna understand mineralization, come to the US-Mexico border. It is there, right in front of you. Unfortunately, the wages are tremendously low. Interesting enough, in Mexico, the North is considered well or better off than the rest of Mexico, but in the United States, the, the border with Mexico is considered among the poorest of the poor. Poor governance on both countries, shared destiny, and depending on who you read, anywhere between 100 to 200 million legal crossings northbound. And migration continues to be primarily around economic reasons, but most recently, it's been sort of like uh, co-founded with political, economic, violence, and many other different things. Now, what about the administration threats? Because that's what I'm here to highlight. My focus is primarily around homelessness, areas of tuberculosis and HIV, and the areas of sexual reproductive health. That's where my training took place. So if you wanna look at what, how well we have done, I have to sort of like go beyond Trump years to understand where have we been as women primarily around access to health and human services. And the reality is that the Obama administration was quite bolder in terms of talking gender equity and access, but it took significant effort during the administration of Obama to advance some of our equal rights. And what has happened in the last year or so, here comes the Trump administration, and what we have seen is that whatever sort of like progress we have made to advance adequate resources and funding, to advance diverse rights, to advance inclusion rights is now sort of like, you know, it has been played in such a way that what we have is what I call Dacronian, Dacronian laws at the state level and in some communities that are putting a halt on equity, funding, resources, and programs. And I'll give you a few examples of that. So even before President Trump was inaugurated, it was clear right from the beginning that issues around sexual and women's health was certainly gonna be a focus of the policy. And second, it was also very clear that some of these changes were targeting primarily the right to terminate a pregnancy, specifically abortion. The second had to do with access to contraception, something that we thought we had already sort of like won we had finally included it in the Affordable Health Care Act, and now we're having conversation about the fact that no, these are services that might not be covered under the Affordable Care Act. Limitations around maternity care, and certainly difficulties in accessing basic medical primary care services. So these progresses that we have had in the last decades are now really compromised by the fact that we're having conversations about the loss of contraception, which we're beginning to see already impacts around the reduction of unintended pregnancies. So it is quite worrisome that whatever progress we have made and their colleagues that are writing on the subject that this progress could be staggered and therefore we can have a reverse on the improvements that we have seen in women's health. And so that has important implications. On the other hand, there is certainly ideological opposition uh, around funding primarily. Funding, which has been primarily U.S. public funding for family planning services. This is, cer this is certainly significant uh, of jeopardy. The appointment of judges, uh, the uh, possibility of having Roe versus Wade overturned, the defunding of Planned Parenthood, the introduction of the American Health Care Act to repeal the Affordable Care Act. I'm so glad that that was put on hold and I don't know for how long, but it's very clear that one of the top priorities of the administration is to what? to really revolt the Obama health care, which is not perfect, but it's much better than what we had before and we can have a different conversation on that. On addition to that, what is happening at the state level is really worrisome, which is Medicaid funding. Medicaid is a public program that primarily allows for the resources that are necessary to pay for primary care. And given the conservative federal policymaker and their different restructuring, you know, states are choosing not to expand Medicaid, which Medicaid is really the instrument that would allow us to ensure primarily most of the women, the families, and those that are in greater needs. So state-level threats, conservative policymakers that can motivate the shutdown of services, exclusion of Planned Parenthood, threats to the Title X funding, 
and the need to defend the critical programs and providers. So what have we been basically spending the last year or so is trying to preserve, trying to defend, trying to organize, document the importance of what would happen if you defund these services. Hostile uh, situations, primarily again immigrant, both women and men, and as you know, refugees and immigrants are communities that traditionally have greater difficulty accessing the basic services. And I'll tell you a little bit more about what we have found in our research. On top of that, during the administration executive order reinstating the global get gap, which is basically banning U.S. foreign aid from serving, uh, from providing services to those clinics that support the termination of pregnancy, the funding of the U.N. Population Fund, and Texas, it's a wonderful state. That's a state where I live. And there are days that I want to move to New Mexico. And then there are days that I want to move to Mexico. And this weekend, I want to stay in Canada. Uh, because, you know, we sort of like are caught between these two countries, but at the same time, a very different America. So Texas could serve as a really interesting cautionary tale of what may be there to come in the next few years. On one hand, you know, my state has slashed 60% of the funds that have resulted in closing clinics and programs and facilities in the state of Texas. So that has important implications primarily for women and for young girls. If on top of that, you add the element of immigration or a mixed immigration status, then you need to be able to understand that there are bigger barriers to access, plus you start giving the employers the liberty to decide what they're going to cover in terms of the health insurance plans limited resources to language capacity and their ability to acquire services on a limited basis. And if we add to that the social stigmas associated with accessing services at a time where you're not sure if you run the risk of maybe being questioned about your immigration status or possibly facing deportation and separation, then you just don't necessarily approach the primary health care services as you should unless there's really an emergency in place. If on top of that you add the element of refugees and migrants that may be fleeing countries where rape is used as a weapon of war, and we're beginning to see more and more women and men sort of like approaching the border communities trying to find asylum, which is not an easy thing uh, to get. And these cuts will undermine really the progress that I think we have made as a country in, may, in trying to improve the quality of life and ideally breaching the Healthy People 2020 goals. So I am concerned. So if these trends do continue, my concern is that we're gonna have certainly more women, men, children without adequate access. We will end up paying the price and we will actually go back in time with advances such as quality prenatal care, certainly you know unintended pregnancies, and most likely you know an increases or series of you know, sexually uh, transmitted infections and so forth. So let's, let me just quickly look at Texas. So Texas, we're, we have the second highest birth rate uh, we basically depend on family planning, public health care services for contraception. Uh, most of our services are publicly funded, and we have also been seeing an increase on the number of people that are uninsured. And you would argue, well, but you have an Affordable Health Care Act, which has certainly helped those that could qualify. But not everyone is beginning to renew the Affordable Health Care mm -hmm. Act. And secondly, those that are undocumented or semi-documented don't necessarily have access to these benefits. Um, when you start looking at El Paso, my community, we're approximately one million in population with another one million on the Mexican side. We start looking at the data, I wonder why, you know, syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia are rates that are increasing in our community, but so are increasing in the state of New Mexico and Ciudad Juarez. So that for me is a red flag that what are we doing to really address sexual reproductive health needs? And so therefore, you know, that's, that's something that, that we are not necessarily addressing very responsibly. Prenatal care, we have dropped. We were much better doing a prenatal, a prenatal care. We were doing quite well in immunizations. And so these are two wonderful indicators that something is happening that we must actually address and protect. So if on top of that, you add the dimension of being a borderlander, a migrant, and being women. Um, keep in mind that the discourse about providing services for women is not really monolithical in nature. And so therefore we need to make sure that we include all women in this conversation, not only immigrant women, those that have semi-documented status, but those women that also are part of the minority groups. So we need to really understand that what is happening in our country, and I love my country, is that we're really violating some basic human rights. And so we need to start 
calling that as it is, because if we're not allowing for women and men to have access to basic healthcare services, then what are we doing as a country? I know that this is not the type of discourse that the administration really welcomes, but we need to find a way to frame it in such a way that we understand that we're doing a, services, a disservice to our communities. So this is the border region, the 2,000 miles, that's home right there, right there on the top, with limited housing, health services. I was telling my colleagues uh, during lunch that you know I live in a city where still almost 220 neighborhoods have difficulties getting drinking water. They don't have access to portable drinking water. And sort of like communities look at me and say, well, no, you're not talking about the United States. And I said, yes, I'm talking about the United States and I'm talking about the outskirts of El Paso City. So we have communities that are really at needing the basics element of sanitation, drinking water, portable water. And so that, that to give you an idea that even though we live in the richest, one of the richest countries on Mother Earth, we have incredible inequalities and disparities, and especially among those that are primarily members of the, of the migrant and um, minority communities. I want to quote my colleague, Tony Fayad, who says that, you know, in the U.S.-Mexico border, there are multiple wars, depending on who you ask, but three that have been highlighted is the drug against war, and against the, the drugs, the, the wars against drugs, the war against immigrants, and the war against terrorists. So, Keep that in mind as, as we move through. This is El Paso as looked upon from Ciudad Juarez. So here is Mexico, here's the wall, and that's El Paso. Um, in population, we're approximately two million, and when I look at the statistics, about 25% of the population of my community lives below the poverty level. Uh, let me talk to you just quickly about a couple of things that we're doing because we're mindful that we have these disparities and most importantly we want to address them. Um, we're working with immigrants that have primarily been survivors of intimate partner violence. Good number of them have been migrants. We use the element of photo voice which is a, uh, a methodology that provides cameras to those that are the most vulnerable, high, also highly resilient and they begin to photograph their lives. So I want to leave you with a couple of stories. These are some of the most resilient women that I participated and work with, and so they photograph their lives. This is a story by Norma. Norma called this, um, what do you see there? You see a big toilet, right? She called this the escape, and this is basically her story of migration and survival in the United States. I was overwhelmed by the many problems and hardships. She, re she refers to the experience of coming into the United States. As I passed through this restroom, I imagined being like a toilet paper. When flush, it could disappear, and along with it, all my problems and the pain I felt by the aggressors were. She's talking about her experience with intimate partner violence. And no, nothing would hurt them. At that moment, I did not care about my children's future. It is important to be aware of the importance of emotional abuse. Avoid criticism, support those who suffer violence. We should educate ourselves about the different kinds and the signs of violence. Mm -hmm. Norma was married to a Border Patrol agent, and um, who, she lived in silence for many years in the fear that if she would denounce the intimate partner violence situation, she would probably would, would be faced with potential dissertation, uh, deportation. I am happy to report that Norma's, Norma's a success story. She applied for BAWA, which is the Violence Against Protection Act. She's now back in school. She's getting her master's degree. She's going on with her life, and so in reality there are many different stories of women that have been survivors that basically speak about their pain, but that also speak about their hope. Um, they also prepare a call to action. If we have time, I can tell you more about what the women say needs to get done. They have it very clear. These are the things that we need to promote, visibility, equity. We need to raise awareness. We need to really invest in prevention and attention. We need to really focus on strategies for services that are really tailored to women. We need to really have sustainable and permanent funding. We need to look at quality access and they stress the importance of providing education for the purpose of empowerment. More recommendations on the subject. And in ending, uh, if you're interested in a study that we did called the Ulysses Syndrome, uh, which begins to document grief associated with migration and mobility, not to be misunderstood with depression or psychiatric conditions, we asked migrants to tell us about their experience primarily moving between countries, and it is incredible that some of these findings, we did a study in three locations, two in Mexico and one in the United States. They speak really about the loss and the nostalgia associated with losing their loved ones or the separation 
uh, basically losing their status, but at the same time gaining safety and security in the United States. Um, in closing, it is very clear, you know, I teach policy courses to social work students. We have our work cut out for us. I tell my students there are three levels in which we need to really be active, all of us as citizens of the world. The micro level, which is sort of like the individual level in the trench of the community. The meso level, which is that of organizations and entities and institutions. But equally important is the macro level, which really focuses on, on policy um, and advocacy. There are multiple challenges. This is a, a model that I use from Janssen that really looks at identifying what the challenges are and beginning to decide how does one plan, where do we focus, how do we frame, how do we analyze, how do we develop strategy, how do we develop the buy-in, how do we implement, and therefore how do we assess. And this is the model that we locally use to, uh, to bring communities together. Um, I, I, bring, I put in the following resources as assets that my university brings because we're very interested in going beyond the United States. So if my colleagues in Canada are interested in exploring work around gender equity, peace, and diversity, we'll be happy to have that conversation with you and see how we can unite our communities. Uh, so my goal is two nations coming together to do things differently, to do adequate investment. But I want to leave you with this message. I, we need your help to be able to humanize the experience of what living in the US-Mexico border region is all about. Uh, last weekend, Despite the fact that we have incredible separation and in their discourse about the wall, and people keep telling us, we're going to construct the wall, and I keep telling them, we already have a wall. What do you mean, construct the wall? We have them. Um, I want you to help us humanize the experience. Uh, you may not be able to see this slide here at the very end, but this is a binational mass. On Saturday of last week, the two communities came together right there on that international bridge between Juarez and El Paso to have mass regardless of what your creed and faith is. We're communities that join hands, bring resources, create resistance because we strongly believe that we can be united despite the fact that governments, political affiliations, and others may want to create more distinction, mark us, and create differences where communities that come together to strive. So I need your help in making sure that we humanize because at the end of the day, we're pretty free citizens. You can try to cross, you can try to put lines, you can try to create walls, but humans have a way of connecting, moving, right? Despite the fact that we can have the structure. So with that, I will pause and thank you very much again for your attention and then we'll entertain questions, comments um, at the very end, okay? Thank you. La place des femmes aux états unis est une qui est très particulière. On est à une période où accéder à la contraception est rendu difficile puisque les employeurs peuvent ne pas la financer ou tomber enceinte à un coût tellement élevé que certaines femmes vont renoncer à avoir un enfant parce qu'elles ne peuvent simplement pas en assumer le coût parce qu'elles ne sont pas assurées et où on n'a pas accès à l'avortement. Ajouter à ça, comme l'expliquait Eva, c'est ce que Andréane étudie, puisqu'on parlait d'Andréane tantôt, ces femmes migrantes qui sont prises et non documentées, qui sont prises dans une espèce de cage entre, coincées entre la frontière et des checkpoints, et qui vont, alors que 90% d'entre elles vont être agressées sexuellement, alors qu'elles traversent la frontière, vont renoncer à avoir accès à une, des soins de première nécessité après un viol, après une agression, après des blessures qui sont des blessures génitales graves. Donc c'est quelque chose, c'est un élément que l'on doit traiter lorsqu'on parle de, des frontières. And, and you have noticed that with border studies, we are always really at the crossroads between academia and advocacy. And I think there is nothing you can do about that. When you see the border, when you see what's happening at the border, you can, and Irasima was talking about that, the emotional toll, right? It's, you, you cannot choose between being a, an aseptized researcher, academic, and being an emotion, emotional human because you are confronted to that. So we've got to deal with that. And sometimes being in academia is kind of a difficult, you know, we, we used to hear that we have to be scientific, but then we hear people, right? And Scott is all about that, actually. So I'll let Great. you talk. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that, actually. I think that's very, a very important point. Uh, I live and teach uh, about 10 miles away from the border and the border wall, uh, and it's so becomes very difficult for me to kind of you know, divorce myself from that reality, that daily reality. Uh, and it makes it so, I find it very interesting to be in a forum like this where uh, I can kind of see that somewhat from other perspectives, from a greater distance. So I'm really looking forward 
to the discussion at the end of this. Um, so to start, I just want to discuss a little bit the walls uh, that are already up, uh, you know, to understand the walls that Trump wants to build. You know, you have to first look at the walls that his predecessors erected and the relevant authorities that he has inherited to have a better sense of where he might go with, with his own schemes. Um, this is a Customs and Border Protection map that shows the walls that were completed by mid-2009. Uh, the only significant change between what this shows and what stands now is down at the very tip of Texas where you see the little red dot and the little yellow dot, and it says that those are uh, under construction and planned under contract, but those have since been completed. And the earliest of these walls were erected in the 1990s. Um, these were 10 foot tall landing mat border walls, and we'll see an image of that in a minute. Um, they were pieced together using four foot by eight foot corrugated steel panels that, that during the Vietnam War had been laid out to, to uh, provide a flat surface for helicopters to set down on. Um, they went up in urban areas mostly, uh, places like San Diego, Calexico, and Nogales. Um, and then in 2005, there were members of Congress who were frustrated because they perceived that the pace of border wall construction was going too slowly. Uh, in particular, a spot uh, just outside of San Diego uh, where Customs and Border Protection proposed blowing the tops off of two hillsides, filling in a canyon so that they could have uh, a level path for the border wall and for a uh, patrol road. And so Congress passed uh, the Real ID Act, a portion of which granted the Secretary of Homeland Security, quote, the authority to waive all legal requirements such secretary and such secretary's sole discretion determines necessary, unquote, to build border walls and associated patrol roads. So the rest of the border walls were built following the passage of the Secure Fence Act in 2006. And in those instances, uh, the Secretary of Homeland Security had that authority, which no one else in the United States has, not the president or anyone else, to waive all laws uh, to build border walls. Um, the Secure Fence Act was amended to call for a minimum of 700 miles of border wall along the approximately 1,950 mile long U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And over time, Customs and Border Protection built 654 miles of wall. And these were a mix of various designs. Um, pedestrian walls that are typically 18 feet tall and are supposed to stop somebody on foot, and vehicle barriers that range about six feet tall and are meant only to stop a car driving across the desert. The Secure Fence Act and the Real ID Act did not have sunset provisions, so those are still in effect, and those are the legal authorities under which the Trump administration is going to operate. Um, and because the Secure Fence Act language stipulated at least 700 miles as opposed to a maximum of 700 miles, mm -hmm. um, Trump can basically build any amount of border wall that he wants on, that, on the southern border. Uh, and his Secretary of Homeland Security uh, will have the authority to again issue more waivers and that's happened twice already. So what he doesn't have uh, yet is the money to build walls. He's got the, you know, the legal authorization to, to build them but he needs cash appropriated from Congress to pay for them. Um, this past spring, the administration asked Congress for $999 million in supplemental fiscal year 2017 funds to build new water, border walls. Uh, Democrats in Congress balked, but ultimately gave the administration $341 million to convert 20 miles of existing pedestrian wall, uh, presumably landing mats like the one on the upper left, um, in Southern, which is in Southern California, and 20 miles of vehicle barrier, like the lower left photo, uh, into taller bollard walls that would presumably uh, resemble the photograph on the right. Mm -hmm. But the only new walls that have been built so far are the eight prototypes near San Diego. Um, these are all 30 feet tall and 30 feet wide. Uh, and supposedly these will inform construction of the hundreds of miles of new wall that the administration wants to build, uh, although some of the walls that are in planning uh, would not actually resemble these at all, so it's unclear how they would actually uh, impact the new walls if they are built. Uh, this one little bit of border wall cost $406,000. Um, so before the prototypes went up, uh, Trump's then Secretary of Homeland Security, John Kelly, who is now his chief of staff, uh, signed a waiver of 36, or 37 laws 
uh, citing the authority granted by the Real ID Act. So these were exempted from just about every law you can imagine. Uh, and when he did that, he also wrote a waiver that the waivers are geographically fixed. It encompassed this, but it also encompassed uh, all of the border, basically fr starting in the Pacific Ocean and extending inward 15 miles. Um, and presumably, this will be some of the area uh, where he would be taking old landing mat walls, because there are some landing mat walls in that stretch, and converting them into something that would look more like this. Uh, but the exact locations for those conversions have not yet been revealed. <clears throat> now, the Real ID Act's waiver provision was intended to preclude legal, legal challenges to the construction of border walls. Um, and as an example, in 2007, the Defenders of Wildlife, uh, which is an environmental organization based in the United States, convinced a court to issue a temporary restraining order halting border wall construction through Arizona's San Pedro Riparian National Conservation Area. Uh, immediately after the, at the time, Homeland Security Secretary Michael Chertoff waived the laws that were the basis for that legal challenge, and then the legal challenge was nullified. Um, other waivers were issued subsequ subsequent to that, and you know, two have been issued by the administration. In those other cases, they, weren't, they were preemptive. There was no pending legal challenge. They simply waived every law that they thought maybe a, a legal challenge could be based upon, uh, and therefore, there can be no legal challenge to them. <clears throat> Nonetheless, uh, there is the ability to challenge waivers, uh, although one cannot challenge a waiver based upon the damage that a wall is going to do. So you can't say, you know, this section of wall through the Otai Mountain Wilderness area, which is supposed to be a roadless wilderness, is clearly going to damage that, that area and cause tremendous erosion. That can't be the basis for a legal challenge. Um, the Real ID Act was written such that the only basis for challenge is on constitutional grounds. So. Three challenges have been filed so far against the Trump administration's waivers. Uh, the first was filed by the Center for Biological Diversity, uh, followed soon after by a suit jointly filed by the Sierra Club and Defenders of Wildlife. Their main thrust was that the Real ID Act was an unconstitutional delegation of, of authority. They're essentially saying that um, the Constitution uh, doctrine of separation of powers does not allow for Congress to give away its power. Congress can make laws, Congress can rescind laws, Congress can't uh, hand off that power to the administration. And so, you know, if these laws are to be waived, they're the ones that would have to do it. There's a third challenge that has been filed by the California Attorney General. Um, and this was based on a somewhat different principle. Um, in each case, you know, both the old waivers and the new waivers included a clause more or less like the one quoted above, uh, and that, said that you know, not only were the named laws, I mean, these are the, the laws that were waived uh, by Secretary Chertoff in 2008, not only were the named laws waived, but any law related to the subject of those laws was also by extension waived, as were all local, state, and federal laws related to the subjects of these named laws. Um, the California uh, Attorney General asserts that Congress cannot grant a federal appointee the power to waive California state laws. Now, a few weeks after Trump's San Diego waiver covering those 15 miles uh, was issued, um, John Kelly moved on up, uh, and the acting Secretary of Homeland Security, Elaine Duke, issued a second waiver covering a three-mile stretch uh, of border wall on the east side of the Calexico, California port of entry. Uh, and that's a f this is a photograph of it. And presumably, that is an indication that this is going to be one of those replacements, one of those sections uh, within the funding that Congress gave them. So the only description of what would take the place of this old landing mat wall is that it will be 18 to 25 feet tall. But otherwise, there's been no description provided. Um, as for the 20 miles of vehicle barrier, you know, there are now 299 miles of vehicle barrier that currently stand. Um, 20 miles, you know, Congress has given the money to, to replace 20 miles of those with some sort of pedestrian wall. Um, there has been no announcement as to where that would occur, uh, although I have obtained documents through Freedom of Information Act requests that indicate that Customs and Border Protection is likely to target uh, part of New Mexico, what they call their Santa Teresa station. 
Um, so from an environmental standpoint, that's more destructive than replacing a section of wall like this. Um, if you've got you know, a 10 or 12 foot physical uh, pedestrian wall and you replace it with an 18 to 25 foot pedestrian wall, it's damaging, but most of that damage has already been done by the older wall. If you take a vehicle barrier and replace it with a pedestrian wall, that's more destructive. It's, you know, uh, animals and water can typically pass through vehicle barriers because the spaces are wider, the height is less. Um, so, you know, from an environmental standpoint, the, this, this stuff is less bad. The vehicle barrier is going to be a lot worse, or the replacement of the vehicle barrier. Now, the administration has also requested $1.6 billion to build 60 miles of border wall in South Texas, Rio Grande Valley. Uh, that's where I live. I could find my house on this map for you if you want. Um, and it's like where the McAllen dot is. So these 60 miles, um, this map was produced in July, uh, kind of released to a local news station despite the law enforcement sensitive uh, marking on the top. Um, they have two designs that they're discussing uh, putting up in the lower Rio Grande Valley. And, and you know, just a little outside of the map, you know, hours drive to the right on this map, uh, you would hit the Gulf Coast just to kind of give you a little bit more orientation. In this map, the red marks are existing levee border walls. And I'll talk in, in a minute about what that means. Uh, the blue marks that are kind of between the red marks are where they would like to build new levee border walls, a total of 28 miles of new levee border walls. Um, the yellow marks, which are in uh, the next county over, Star County, those would be bollard walls. Uh, and I'll talk about that in just a second as well. Um, but in these cases, one thing you'll notice is the distance between the lines on the map and the border. Uh, this is a function of the fact that the, the treaty that established the Rio Grande as the border precludes building anything within the floodplain of the Rio Grande that could deflect water. The United States can't do it, Mexico can't do it. Um, and so where the red and blue marks are, there's a levee system and there's a matching levee system in Mexico. Um, where the yellow marks are, there is no levee system. Uh, and that distancing from the river is supposed to keep these walls uh, from being a treaty violation. Um, they didn't exactly line that up, but that's the idea. And this is what the old levee border walls look like. So, you know, again, to, in an attempt to avoid those floodplain and treaty issues, uh, when walls were built in 2009, um, they took the existing levees, carved away the river facing one third of the earthen levee, kind of in its original form, you imagine like a hill with a nice slope on, on both sides. They carve away one side, put in the concrete wall, and then where there was going to be a ramp, and in this area, there they would later put in a dirt ramp so they could drive through it. They would put these bollards, these steel posts, uh, on the top of it. <clears throat> that meant that you weren't going between the levee and the river, and therefore you weren't in the floodplain, and therefore, uh, as far as the treaty was concerned, uh, it was not such a big problem. Um, that is essentially what the Trump administration is now talking about doing for the other areas. They would carve away the river-facing side of the levee, put in concrete, uh, but in, in most of the existing levee border walls, it's just the concrete. Uh, for the Trump walls, it would be concrete plus uh, another 18 feet of uh, bollards on top. Now for the existing walls, you have approximately 8,300 acres of of land, which is a mix of privately owned farms and federally owned wildlife refuges that are in you know, what we call the no man's land between the levee border wall and the actual border. Um, add in the 28 miles of proposed and you will get an additional 16,400 acres uh, of property in the no man's land. Now, levee border walls that exist 
and those that have been proposed both repeatedly cut across or cut off portions of the lower Rio Grande Valley National Wildlife Refuge. Um, this refuge was established to, to preserve biodiversity and to provide habitat for threatened or endangered species like the ocelot. Uh, the refuge is composed of a series of tracts of land that mostly hug the Rio Grande. So it's not, in some cases, refuges are one big continuous block of territory. In this case, they are often separated by farmland or private property, but they all touch the river or mostly touch the river. And so for an ocelot uh, that might not feel comfortable running across an open farm field, they can go down to the river and follow that little ribbon of vegetation that's typically there because you know a farmer is not going to drive their tractor up to the water's edge, so there's usually some amount of vegetation there. <clears throat> the, the total length of the river that is covered by this is 275 miles, river miles. So it creates what's referred to as a wildlife corridor that animals, terrestrial animals, can use to move from place to place. Now for an ocelot, when you have a normal uh, situation, they can go up and over it. Um, but if you put in a levee wall, they clearly can't. They're trapped. Uh, and these two slides below were created because they're looking at the, the uh, Santa Ana National Wildlife Refuge as an initial place to build new border walls, um, mainly because it's federally owned. Uh, if they have to go elsewhere, they have to condemn property. And because they don't have to worry about things like the Endangered Species Act, that avoidance of the need to condemn property uh, becomes very attractive. The other type of wall that's being t discussed, uh, the, the yellow line before, is in Cameron County, in, uh, sorry, in uh, Star County, there are existing bollard walls in Cameron County. So these are basically 18 foot tall steel posts with spaces in between. Uh, the new ones would be 18 to 25 foot tall. For the existing ones like this, they put them on the north side of the levee so that they would stay out of the floodplain and wouldn't deal with those, those flooding issues. And that's why you can see there the levee in the background on the other side of the wall. This is looking south with a border patrol truck on it. In the proposed walls, many of them would be in the floodplain. Um, they don't have levees there. And so not to avoid uh, the floodplain would often mean putting whole towns behind the border wall. And that's you know, not any fun to have to deal with. Now, you, the Customs and Border Protection has for a long time tried to pretend that border, bollard walls like this allow for the passage of water, but they don't. Um, you know, they, when you have a flood, whether it's a hurricane rolling up the Rio Grande, because we're not that far from the coast, or you have something like this where the border wall crosses a wash, flood water carries debris, debris clogs the spaces between the walls, and then you get damming and it becomes a solid obstruction. And that's why Mexico has said repeatedly that if they build this in the floodplain of the Rio Grande, they would see it as a treaty violation and it would be a big risk to communities on both sides of the river. So this is one of the places where they are talking about building uh, these border walls. That little dirt road in the foreground, that's where the wall would be. Um, and that's clearly in the Rio Grande floodplain. Up above it, kind of on the far right edge of the picture, you can see City Hall. And here you're seeing essentially the same place from a higher view. Uh, and then that's the dot that says Roma on the map. And this also shows the, the twin problems. If you have a solid obstruction in between the community and the river, water can't drain properly. You get a big rainstorm, a hurricane that rolls up, or a tropical storm, something with a lot of, uh, a lot of rain. Water can't drain to the river. The river swells and it is deflected on the U.S. side. Flooding is worse on, Ciudad Alem on the Ciudad Aleman side in Mexico. Um, and, and you even have the potential of moving the river. You know, if the river is deflected far enough, it can settle into a new channel, which means you just move the border. And so I always like to close with this picture because it's my favorite. Um, it's, it's extremely frustrating from my perspective um, to kind of see some of these coming, to see um, if these walls are built, here are some of the damages that will be inflicted, and to simultaneously know that these walls have very little effect on immigration. Um, pretty much the biggest impact that they have is 
raising the fees for smugglers. But as far as stopping anybody, they don't do anything. Um, as far, you know, whether you're talking about smuggling, whether you're talking about uh, immigration, it, they, they're basically just there um, as a billboard. You know, they're, they're just there for politicians to be able to say, I did something. Um, the, you know, the Government Accountability Office said in 2009, shortly after that initial map was produced, that Customs and Border Protection had not made any effort to show that their border walls did anything. They said the same thing again this past February. Um, you know, these are political constructs as mm -hmm. opposed to being anything that uh, does what they claim their intended purpose is. So, thank you. Perfect, thanks. Il y a d'ailleurs un rapport de, du GAO, je pense, qui explique que le, le mur a un speed bump effect, and that's about it. So, and uh, you can see pictures of catapults being, um, um, how do you say, screwed to, to, to the wall. So they are using, mm -hmm. smugglers or traffickers are using, you know, the wall per se as a tool to, um, to, to, to throw um, drugs on the other side of the border, or you've got those pictures of ramps, uh, you know, and cars going over those very high walls. So we know for sure that those are not deterrent, but just actually, as you were saying, just raising the price, it's, it, it costs more than a, a business class um, flight to cross the border now if you're illegal and undocumented. Uh, so it means a lot about, you know, the changes that the wall is. Uh, people are more vulnerable, dying more, as you were saying. Everybody's more vulnerable, but the U.S. are not more secure. Um, Est-ce que vous avez des questions? Je suis sûre que vous en avez. Ne soyez pas timide. Have we depressed everybody? <laughs> <laughs> Bon. Allez, Frédéric. Non plus OK. Bon, j'aurais essayé. Très bien. Um, actually, you haven't shown the, the, the pictures of the handprints on the, on the wall, right? Do you have that? I didn't have space. Oh, you didn't have the space. The first one had the footprints, though. The opening slide had the footprints. Oh, I, I didn't see that. OK. okay. So all, the, all the text is distracting. Oui. Est-ce que si vous avez une question à poser, vous pouvez aller jusqu'au micro, s'il vous plaît, qu'on vous entende Et parce que c'est enregistré. Vous allez parler pour la postérité. Merci. Présentez-vous. Oh, ma postérité. Ah, allô. C'est beau. Um, so my name is Sophie Mason. I'm studying at the UCAM University. Um, I'm very interested in the feminicid on the side of um, Juarez. So I was wondering what's happening with the feminist um, groups that are uh, activists against, or actually um, uh, trying to get some policies for uh, the, the, the uh, human trafficking instead of have focusing only their policies against narcotics war. I don't know if I'm clear. Um, that's an excellent point. If we, if we, if we had more time, we can certainly talk about the different dynamics of how crime is organized. But there is, uh, you know, the media has helped us to communicate to the international world that there are crimes that are directed at women, especially girls and very young women. And Juarez, Ciudad Juarez, which is a sister city to El Paso, has been on the international news as one community where the number of, of murders associated with gender crimes, hate, and a few other dimensions are beginning to be documented. Uh, the first thing I want to say that it's not specific to Ciudad Juarez, that this is a global phenomena and that we see it all over the world. However, my sister community has begun to document and to really get the voices of the women, primarily the survivors and the families of those that have been murdered to speak out. So this loss has generated in our border community significant resistance to the point that in the last 17 years, um, laws have been introduced and laws are beginning to be enforced 
And so therefore, the authorities are beginning to put more attention and beginning to find compensation for crime victims and beginning to elevate the discourse of the importance against really violence and begin to norm a community of peace and gender and equality and denouncement, which is not easy to do, but it's taken us now close to 17 years. Has it stopped? No. No, to this day, you know, I turn on the television in, in my community and I know of women that are murdered. Uh, from my conversations with feminists and organizers on the Mexican side, they're beginning to see a greater number now of incest cases that are being denounced. There is greater awareness about intimate partner violence, so more women are coming out uh, to seek care. Um, and, and greater awareness is being made but no, it hasn't stopped. Now, there is an incredible movement of community-based organizations. Uh, when I get back on Saturday, on Sunday, I'm taking a scholar from Philadelphia who is very well established in the United States. She does a lot of work around forgiveness and racial healing. And she's coming to the border to have a better understanding of feminist side and how does community like ours begin to forgive and understand. That's a powerful piece. And so we're meeting with survivors and mothers of young girls that have been murdered. And it's been the mothers, the ones that have really brought to the attention of the authorities the need to create a justice system. And so, yes, on Sunday, that's, that's our task, to bring our, uh, our colleagues so that we can mutually educate and begin to have conversations and continue to bring greater attention on the issue. But that's, that's, a, that's an issue that we keep tackling every single day. Um, things that we can do, educate early. Critical, and we need systems that can truly protect girls and women and men as well and boys. And we need to change the way that we address masculinity because there are things on our sexuality that are very toxic that need change. And it starts by having adequate conversations and norming a community and a culture of peace and understanding and respect. And it's something that um, if you have ideas, strategies, recommendations, if you know what has worked, I'm open. Um, because we, we can really learn from others as well. I don't know if that answers your question or not. Sure. I would like to, I would like to, to answer this question from a different perspective because you were asking of why m much more attention is being paid towards combating uh, drug trafficking or organized crime versus combating crimes like human trafficking or human rights abuses against migrants or against human beings. It's, and this, this is a question that I have been asked uh, several times. First of all, activism at the border is complicated. For example, the case of Ciudad Juarez or the case of the Western border like around the area of Tijuana, it's easier because you have more groups, you have uh, more resources and people are, are incorporated into a big, larger community. Uh, our border has borders in, you know, in the different segments. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult to get together the activists to, to, to come together and, and to fight a cause. While when you're talking about organized crime, particularly drug trafficking, uh, there are agencies, law enforcement agencies, particularly in the United States, a drug enforcement agent, a, a agency, plus all these contractors that, that lobby in Congress uh, for, the, for the construction of drones, uh, to, to fight drugs. Sometimes, sometimes the reality of, of what is really happening is not fought the way it has to. If you want to finish with the problem of drug consumption in the United States, you would do it in a different way. You would not do it at the border. You wouldn't enforce drugs at the border. You wouldn't enforce... Uh, I mean, the consumption of drugs, if, I mean, and you treat it as, the, as a, and we, we have talked a lot about that as a, as, a, as, as, a, as a public health issue in the United States. But it gives money, it's, it's money. And there are many, um, there, are, there are many actors that are, that, that will gain a lot uh, trying to fight organized crime, trying to fight the drug trafficking because it means resources. The, and, and federal resources to protect, supposedly protect the border. And we have, uh, we have, we have heard by all these presentations that really the, the policies that have been implemented lately are not making the United States or our region more secure. On the contrary, this, this, uh, this, uh, uh, I mean, this, these policies have strengthened the connection between transnational smuggling networks, organized crime, drug trafficking, and that has generated an oligopolization of criminal activities instead of dismantling this, this network. Il y a véritablement un complexe sécuritaire ou industriel, et on parle beaucoup d'argent symbolique. This morning was saying, follow the money, 
There is a lot to follow down there. Marie Lamèche de Biggs à Concordia. Hi, um, I work for a human rights center here in Montreal, and um, what I'd like to know, um, after Trump was elected, we saw a large um, women's resistance movement, um, especially in Washington, and um, I'd like to know what, what do you think women in the U.S. are doing for, um, for, for the cause of um, migrants? Um, and f uh, female migrants in, in particular, are they doing something? Have you seen some, you know, resistance in organizing for, for these women in particular? Thank you. Uh, we, can, we can go together. Um, activism in the United States has been manifested in different ways, particularly in the last year uh, and the march uh, mm -hmm. after, after Trump's uh, uh, I mean, a, 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 a strong inauguration was, uh, was, uh, was uh, an example of it. Unfortunately, uh, we know that this is a representative democracy, and unfortunately, we can push, but, but because of what we have been talking about with regards to the media and the attention that this book is focusing on, what Trump says or not, and foreign policy, you know, these, these subjects of human rights and women's rights are not really, I, I mean, we're not putting the attention that we should be putting now. We're more concerned about what is going to be the future of the United States in the conflict with North Korea, and if Trump is fighting with this senator or this other senator, and what he tweeted in the morning that really, you know, that this has been, this, I mean, dissolving like the like the possibilities of these different groups getting together and producing something and, and pressuring. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, it's representatives. Uh, it's, it, we are living in a very unfortunate time where activism <laughs> is not being, you know, uh, I mean, there, there's no possibility of, of, of consolidation of, of different movements in the states. And at the same time, yes. there is, we talk about the invisible movement, the resistance school, so mm -hmm. maybe there are some things going on. Yes, I think that probably what, what I have seen to be the most effective is what is happening in local communities. And of course, you can see the march, you can see the social media outlets, you can see the national organizations, you can see the think tanks pre uh, preparing reports to give evidence of why is this important to protect the funding. And all of those are incredible resources. But I'm thinking of things that locally need to, need to take place, like electing officials, that are representative of refugees, migrants, and women. And we're beginning to see some of that happening. The elections, as of this week, begin to give us greater hope that we are approaching a time where we are opening up the space for others to participate, speak, and represent us. Second, I know that in the state of Texas, where, where we are spending our time is sort of like trying to defeat legislation that passed by a few votes that begin to put locks into women's choices, you know, like the choice to decide, you know, if you're going to remain pregnant or not, and where you're gonna interrupt a pregnancy. And, and so a lot of the activities are around specific pieces of legislation mm -hmm. that are sort of like moving away from basic rights to services, like protecting, you know, the Violence Against Women's Act that was in danger about a year and a half ago and so that's where I have seen the greatest traction. How not to lose those things that have already been gained without really focusing our attention on the big picture. Uh, protecting the dreamers, you know. We spend our time at our university making sure that our students, that our dreamers, feel comfortable and safe. And that we try to dispel all the myths that are associated with what the media is saying because every time that the media speaks uninformally, and they say, you know, raids are happening in your community. The Border Patrol is having checkpoints, you know, on this section of the city. That creates incredible damage to us. The community members don't want to go out. People don't want to go out to work. Why? Because in some cases, they have mixed immigration status. Children are fearful. Children don't want to go to school. Why? I said, because they don't know if their parents are going to be there when they go back. And so this is as real as it gets. You know, my students are saying, you know what, Professor, I may not be coming to class the next two days because my parents just got deported. And here I am, you know, a student, and all of a sudden I'm also the provider, but I'm also the guardian, and I don't want my siblings to go into a foster care system which is broken in our country because that's not where children ideally need to be uh, nourished and flourished unless you're really running for issues of safety. And so for some, it's some of those daily survival needs. 
Uh, for us, it's trying to get women to denounce violence, which is, has been normalized. And so it's women, you have a right. But I, I am fearful, no, you have a right. In this country, you have a right to seek protection. And these are the things that you need to do, and this is the systems that you have to navigate. And your children have rights as well, even though they may not feel, why? Because they're probably members of the communities of color. We haven't really discussed, but racism is real. It's as real as it gets in the country and across the world. And so you do see citizens that are treated as second, third citizens in which you, they don't believe they have rights. And so we spend a lot of time trying to educate in the trenches of the individual level, family, community. But I'm hopeful that we're beginning to see more um, elected officials. But now we need to hold them accountable. That's the key. That's <laughs> yeah. the key. That's a lot of work. Maybe regarding the refuge of uh, Santa Ana, which is quite mm -hmm. an exceptional ecological refuge, what, what are you, I know you're working on that dossier, what are you guys doing to make sure, well, to try at least, <laughs> not to have a border wall there? Well, like, I, yeah, I think that, that it, it's the same kind of thing. People are responding more, and I think activism has kind of really stepped up in a big way. We've got a lot better response from communities because people feel like they're under threat. I think it's a lot easier to get people to um, be active when they feel threatened than when they're just trying to kind of push the ball a little farther and make you know, incremental improvements. On and so, um, you know, with Santa Ana, you know, this is a, a wildlife refuge that, you know, the Trump administration wants to put a little piece of wall in. It would be a 2.9 mile long piece of wall in the middle of a 10 mile gap, but they want to put it there because it's federally owned. They could do it fast, and so from their perspective, it'd be cheap. That has really upset a lot of people locally because you know this is a, tr a treasured thing. It's important for our ecotourism economy as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's upset a lot of people nationally and internationally. People will come down to the, the Rio Grande Valley to see birds because we have bird migrations coming through. There's a birding festival like right now. Um, but I think that another facet of this when you're talking about organizing act organizing and activism on the border and in border communities are the ways that our communities are very marginalized. You know, there's, there's not the same economic base. And so when you're talking about uh, like our, our US senators that are running for a statewide office, they're not gonna get their donations from our area because there's just not the money there. So they don't really care. Money um, again. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, also you know, we, so you know, I, I work, I volunteer with the Sierra Club. Um, you know, we've had gotten very good uh, relationships with organizations like uh, La Union del Pueblo Entero, uh, which focuses more on immigrants' rights. Um, and, you know, their members, they have many members who are undocumented or mixed status families. And so there, you know, there will be a big rally and they'll say, well, you know, a big contingent of our membership can't go because they're afraid there might be law enforcement present. And so they would be putting themselves at risk. Or if we have a, an event that's anywhere near the border or the border wall, they're like, I'm not going there. And I, that's a perfectly valid concern. I mean, it's not, you know, if you can get arrested just for going to the doctor, you, you're definitely putting yourself at risk if you put yourself closer to where Border Patrol agents are. Um, and so I think it's, it, on the one hand, it is great to see this um, mobilization that is occurring, um, but you know, it's one in which those of us who are mobilizing uh, are, uh, don't have the strongest footing, and so it makes it very difficult. Mm -hmm. Très intéressant. Um, je voudrais finir ce panel avant de remercier nos panelistes. Pour remercier the people who are working backstage for in geopolitics and border geopolitics. And they are the ones who specifically, Fred has outsourced that panel with my team, so I want to thank my team specifically. Those are the greatest the best, the best woman ever. Uh, J'aimerais remercier Andréane Bissonnette, uh, Talia daragon giguer Mathilde Bourgeon, et puis je dois ajouter Frédéric Véraud et Mylène de Repentigny-Corbeil, et Maxime Mine, qui est notre garçon invité, parce que ça en prend toujours, hein. vous avez remarqué qu'on est très attaché à la parité. And I would like to thank the panelists for this very interesting, although quite depressing, panel. <laughs>